Today's guest, Jamal Ashayed, an award-winning correspondent for Al Jazeera. Another Palestinian journalist was shot and killed, Ghufran. She was fully Palestinian, so the world hasn't heard about her the same they heard about Shireen. Double standards, selective outrage, and the way in which the media chooses to in a spotlight when and how, if it wishes. Israel targeting journalists is a big problem, regardless of their nationality. It's a crime against humanity no matter what. How many funeral processions do you have to attack before an international community he looks at this and is like, hey, that's not great. The last apartheid regime in South Africa, often when they are at the end of their tether, that they are their worst because you are in a corner, you have lost the fight. We are seeing the unraveling of an apartheid system. It's sort of like that old advertisement where it's like, how many licks does it take to get to the center of apartheid? You're playing whack-a-mole unless you fully address Zionism, which is the beginning and end of all of the problems. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 58 of the Palestine Pod, the weekly podcast where we break down the latest headlines dealing with Palestine from all over the world and bring you stories, commentary, and interviews with the aim of supporting the Palestinian struggle for justice and equal rights. I'm one of your hosts, Lara E. You might know me from Instagram as at Gazan Girl, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mikey B. What's up, y'all? Mikey B on TikTok, Michael Scherzer on Instagram, and you can call me Mikey Intifada if you kept saying we should wait for an investigation, and then they just came out saying there will be no investigation. Okay. Today's guest is Jamal Ashayed, an award-winning international correspondent for Al Jazeera English. He joined the channel in 2006 and covered a number of major stories, including the 2011 uprisings in Egypt, Libya, Syria, and Yemen. Some of his exclusive reports include uncovering secret documents from inside Gaddafi's intelligence headquarters and uncovering torture and human rights abuses inside Egyptian prisons. Jamal was Al Jazeera's main reporter during the 2013 coup in Egypt, the 2014 coup in Yemen, and the 2016 failed coup attempt in Turkey. What's up with this guy's history? This, this guy either follows coups or coups follow him, you know? <laughs> Jamal, welcome to the Palestine Pod. How's it going? Thank you hey. so much for being here. We are so excited to chat with you. I really wanted to invite you to talk to us after I saw the clip that you posted of you speaking with the Pentagon spokesperson. Yeah, that merchant of death whose name we don't care about. <laughs> I was just going to say his name, but you know what? Let's just let's stick with that. Mm-hmm. And he was also on the Gaza flotilla, the Mavi Marmara, when it was attacked in 2010. So my, my report actually from on board the flotilla that was heading to Gaza was the last one to make air uh, before the Israelis cut communication. And it was after they had killed uh, the first two passengers, the second of which was shot in the head. He fell on top of me, actually, whilst uh, whilst I was on board. Jesus. He was actually also a photojournalist. He was a a Turkish photojournalist taking a picture of the helicopters where they were trying to descend from. And he got shot in the head and then then fell on top. Uh, And that was exactly, just so you know, 12 years to to last night. It was the 31st of May, 2010. Wow. Yeah. Just and as a, as a kind of coincidence in terms of uh, totally, uh, and in that in that incident, Israel also killed another American. They did. Yes, he was eighteen yeah. years old, I believe. The Turkish American, yeah, yeah. Forkan Dogan. Forkan, yeah, yeah. Forkan Dogan. And he never saw justice or nope. anything really. That... I bet you they did an investigation, though. I'll tell you the interesting thing is the Israelis didn't, but Turkey being obviously you've got a state here, Turkey pushed for a United Nations one, which was actually very um, comprehensive in that mm-hmm. it brought a lot of the, the people, but ultimately the United Nations falls short of because the report comes and it goes to the Security Council, right? And it's mm-hmm. for the Security Council to do anything with it. So the report itself was actually very good and it was very comprehensive and uh, transparent and independent and all of those things. But even then, when you've done the investigation, there's no there's no body to implement what is meant to happen, right? Uh, so that's where it fell flat on its face is that uh, it never then got picked up. And then there was a case at the ICC, which the judge who turned out to have certain marital ties through whatever with with certain lobbies also filibustered and stopped at the end as well wow and that's also interesting because now what we're seeing in the aftermath of the killing of shirin is that 
now we have all these organizations and human rights groups that are calling for a UN investigation because they don't know what else to do. So now everyone's mm-hmm. saying UN investigate, UN investigate. And what you're saying to us now is that even when the UN has investigated similar killings in the past, it has not led to any justice because the methodology, true, the but- procedure in place does yeah. not allow for it. I mean, we, we so we've, we've seen that generally speaking in terms of when we talk about, and I, I genuinely despise this term international community because yeah. it's a redundant and meaningless one, but we sure. have a broken system, right? Uh, and we've seen it, we've seen it in uh, incapable of stopping wars, whether it's in the region, like we've seen in Iraq or the invasion and occupation of Iraq, or we've seen recently invasion of Ukraine, other places, there is, there is unfortunately zero mechanism that that can prevent war quite simply and zero mechanism that can prevent crimes against humanity and zero mechanism that can prevent uh, 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 other atrocities happening what we are hoping for and more realistic and what we're trying to do obviously that's the end everyone would love to live in a world where you have a system that stops that what you're hoping for is at least at least to be able to come up with some sort of a mechanism that brings accountability to those who commit those crimes so that at least it can be some sort of a deterrent. Of course. From a journalistic perspective, obviously, unfortunately, we failed flat. In fact, it was just a couple of days ago that another Palestinian journalist, female, was shot and killed, this time point blank, uh, essentially, Ghufran. Uh, she wasn't a dual national. She was fully Palestinian. So yeah. obviously the world hasn't heard about her the same they heard about Shireen, uh, may she rest in peace. And uh, and that's a, <laughs> that's a whole another level of the kind of double standards, the the selective outrage uh, that exists even amongst the progressives that we have in our free so-called free democratic societies as well, and the way in which the media chooses to uh, shine a spotlight when and how and if it wishes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I was going to actually raise the issue of Ofran with you because when we talk about the way that the media covers certain stories, the amount of airtime that they're given, the choices that are made in you know, back rooms that we as a public are not privy to and how we can communicate these things. I mean, Israel targeting journalists is a big problem regardless of their nationality. It's a crime against humanity no matter what. It doesn't matter what passport they have. And the fact that they would so brazenly go to kill another female Palestinian journalist in the weeks after they committed this very public and publicized murder of Shireen. It's to me, it's very, it's very terrifying. It's, it's, it's like, it's like, they're like, see, we did it. Nothing happened. We're going to do it again and nothing will happen. And then they attacked the funeral procession again, again, (laughs) again. How many funeral processions do you have to attack before an international community looks at this and is like, hey, that's not great, right? Like, they're, they're putting numbers up. They're trying to the put... Questions, they're, they're putting that question out, quite frankly, and, and, and no one wants to answer it. I mean, I look at it from two different perspectives. I mean, one, it is... Obviously, it's, it's ghastly, it's shocking, it's disturbing, it's scary, it's ang- it, you know, infuriating. There are so many emotions in it, right? Mm-hmm. Especially, and I say this as a journalist, as a journalist who worked with Shireen, as a journalist who, uh, you know, up until uh, the flotilla worked in Palestine and other places. Obviously, there's, there's, many, there's many different uh, thoughts that go through your mind when you see it. And there's, there's even more thoughts that go through your mind when you see the lack of justice that's being implemented. But at the same time, where I would maybe slightly kind of give you a different perspective, Lara, when you're yeah, talking about kind of please do. the scary element of it. And I say this now, not from, not from the perspective of somebody who understands, uh, you know, the, the Palestinian situation and, and, and has an issue with apartheid and occupation and so forth, just from, a, from, from the perspective of human rights and freedom and looking at it through the prism of what we saw, for example, in terms of the, the last apartheid regime in South Africa, that often it is at the, when they are at the end of their tether, that they are their worst. Because you are in a corner, you have lost the fight. You've lost it. The, the truth of the matter is, the, you know, the whole story of the emperor's uh, uh, new clothes is true. The, the truth of the story is, people have seen 
over the past 10 years, I'm not even going to go through decades, just over the past 10 years, what have we seen? Over the past 10 years, we've seen three wars on a besieged enclave, uh, whilst besieging that enclave of 2 million people in the world's biggest open-air prison. We have seen constant attacks on journalists and the blowing up of buildings live on TV. We have seen white phosphorus being used. We have seen a protester on a wheelchair who lost both his limbs protesting and then was shot by a sniper whilst he was on the wheelchair protesting. We have seen attacks on journalists either being prevented from entering to, to report on something or physically the breaking of one of my other colleagues, uh, Javar al-Bideri, uh, attacked. We have seen uh, settlers coming from Brooklyn and brazenly saying that we are taking this house, it's ours. Right, despite very clear chronological deeds that establish the rights of those properties. Anything, pick anything, whether it's from, like I say, or we've seen how many children detained, or the closure or the banning of people like uh, Omar Shaker of Human Rights Watch or Inter Amnesty International and their staff from entering. Any field you want to look at, the crimes have become so evident that anybody who doesn't have a vested political interest, who just genuinely wants to believe in equality and freedom, no longer want wants to see this right and they there is no way to cover it up so when you have lost that the only mo you can go for is the military might you've lost mm -hmm. the argument you lost the battle for hearts and minds you've lost the pr spin you've lost all of those snazzy things when you have you know the argentinian national football team saying it's not going to go and play in uh, the, uh because of uh, an, a boycott uh, and when you start seeing a bds movement that's increasing when you start seeing cnn of all uh, platforms yeah. and like mainstream American platforms calling out what the lies that are being said. So, so why I say I'm not so worried, I'm not so scared. Of course, in the immediate future, I'm worried. I'm worried for other journalists who could get killed, who could get in prison, and so forth. But on the long term, we are seeing the unraveling of an apartheid system, and it will unravel. It's going to be a snowball effect. We're going to see it a lot quicker than we, what we've seen over the past few years. We've seen the cracks but you're going to see the crumbling over the next five, six years. Absolutely. General Mills just pulled out as well. And that makes them one of several corporations now that have decided to listen to the public pressure of the BDS movement and divest from the occupation. Ben and Jerry's last year. I mean, there's plenty. It's great because these wins are just getting bigger and more troublesome for the occupation. Right. The, the second I hate to say it, but the second corporations jump on, that's when apartheid is going to fall. The, the way it works is sort of like that old advertisement where it's like, how many licks does it take to get to the center of apartheid? Right. Like, yeah. who knows? Yes. I myself was surprised, actually, when I saw this CNN headline. I mean, the headline says very clearly they were shooting directly at the journalists. New evidence suggests Shireen Abu Akla was killed in targeted attack by Israeli forces. That is stronger language than CNN has used in the past to describe similar situations. And, and the report was, was very good. It went through the entire chronology. It relied on eyewitness evidence. They did like the whole breakdown of where she was and where the, you know, the, the occupation army was and where the recorded positions of Palestinian resistance fighters were. So, you know, it really very clearly was able to dispel the the barrage of, you know, contradictory and confusing and, and fabricated statements that were put out by Israel in the hours and in the days after the killing of, of Shireen Abu Akla. So I, I want to ask you, I mean, I, I know that Al Jazeera... <laughs> This is really, I mean, this is not the first time that Al Jazeera has been targeted. As you mentioned, in May 2021, the entire building of where Al Jazeera had its offices in, in Gaza was, was targeted in an attack where the entire building was completely demolished. You've talked about other attacks and aggressions on some of your other colleagues. You yourself also have, have lived through some very harrowing experiences. You mentioned being literally right there in the uh, on the flotilla in um, May 2010 when it was attacked by Israeli commandos. Were they commandos? Is that the right they term? They were commandos. Was, they sent an, two warships on either side, two helicopters, and God knows how many rubber dinghies surrounded the Which is ship insane. of unarmed aid workers and journalists. It's insane. It's insane. I mean, when I think back about uh, back to the flotilla, it, it, I mean, 
it's insane. It's insanity. It's insanity that this that this was allowed to happen. They literally targeted a humanitarian effort like a hostile military intervention. The only thing they came out with it when they tried to justify, obviously it was an international war. By the way, an interesting thing, which a lot of people, and I know now, you know, 12 years have passed, right? At the time of the attack, uh, according to all uh, maritime readings and my report at the time, the ship, once the ship, the lead ship, the Mavi Marmara, which I was on, had seen the Israelis, obviously it was heading towards Gaza. This was in the middle of, we first made the spotting around 10, 10.30 p.m. local time where we were at the time we were heading. The attack happened at 4 a.m., right? When we saw it, the captain and the lead ship decided to divert away from Gaza towards Egypt so that they can buy time until the day so that there wouldn't be a confrontation and hope for some sort of diplomatic intervention. So they actually, and according to the United Nations investigation into this, attacked in international waters at the time, right? The only thing they came out to try and justify this when they showed was, obviously we were at sea for three, four days, you've got 500 people on board, you cook. They showed a picture that had like five kitchen knives in it. They love, was the they love the knives thing. They love that. They were going to stab right. us from the water. From the water. <laughs> right? They stabbed us from their boat, their water boat. Yeah. Essentially. And, uh, and yeah, and they, they shot. And the first two that were killed, again, established by, the, by the, in, in, the investigation, were shot from the helicopter above. They weren't even shot whilst the, the commandos were on deck. That's wild. That's crazy. They say dumb shit all the time. Like they said people at the funeral procession for Shireen were throwing rocks and throwing guns. Dude, how do you throw something when your hands are holding up a casket? That's ridiculous. I mean, Palestinians, uh, I guess, have extraordinary ability. But I'll tell you what it it speaks to, Mike, is this is that and this is where the CNN thing you were talking about is important and what we, we've been trying to push from a journalistic perspective for people to depart from. You know, as an Arab growing up in the UK, I was born in Scotland, I grew up in London. And often uh, when I started my journalistic career, I was often accused of being biased, right? And I used to say, well, firstly, you know, this, the concept of bias and whatever, we can get into a different discussion. But I, it was very infuriating because it was the other, it was the person accusing me of being biased that I saw as being biased, right? And I think this is where we have reached a point where I think there's such a huge several watershed moments that we have witnessed over the past 10 years. And each one of them have thankfully redirected the narrative towards a more accurate one. It's it's very simple. You as a journalist must report accurately before the past 10 years. And if I'm not to kind of like blow Al Jazeera's own horn here or on trumpet and so forth. But prior to our reporting, particularly on the war in Gaza in 2008, my colleague or former colleague, Ayman Mahideen, now at NBC, who was there and the great work he did, as well as Shirin Tadros and others. Prior to that, it was perfectly acceptable for international broadcasting companies and, and media organizations to report on what was happening to the Palestinians from the Israeli perspective. And what I mean by that, even geographically, as in there was not many people who were actually present in Gaza. In fact, we were the only at the time English language international broadcaster during the 2008 Gaza war. That has shifted. And this is something that's so significant because when you say they say crazy shit, they're used to saying crazy shit. Why? Because people would just gobble that up without questioning. And that's the truth. When I see stupid headlines, and not to single out the New York Times here, but unfortunately it's the only one that comes. And no, in fact, I won't single them out. Them and the Associated Press, who ironically their own office was bombed. When they talk about clashes at a funeral, honestly, it's a crime against journalism when you write something like this, right? But I think, and here is maybe a question, that, and I'd love to hear from you, you guys, your perspective and looking at it, because I am from inside, right, from the journalistic perspective. I view people, I was just in, as you might know, in, in, in Washington just last week, and I was meeting with different people about it and the push to try and get some sort of justice for Shireen. And people were saying, well, you know, yes, it's evident that she was clearly identified, uh, identifiable as a, as a journalist and, and wearing it and so forth, which begs the question, then why would Israel do something so stupid? Now, my understanding or my interpretation to it is quite simple, is that the same way Israel knew our building was there and they told us we're going to bomb you. So you've got half an hour to get out or they gave us 45 minutes or whatnot. And it was done. There is a very clear uh, trajectory to the thought process. Number one, and first and foremost, we know we're going to get away with it. Right. And this, I think nobody can argue because there has been no 
credible sanctions placed on Israel to prevent or to, to do it. Number two, it is all about striking fear into people. So as journalists now, and I've seen that with my colleagues, both inside and outside, and myself, I'll tell you, I mean, I when I went to go on the flotilla, I remember, again, Ayman said to me, dude, if you go, they had threatened, anyone who goes will be banned for 10 years. So I said, you're not going to be able to report. I said to him, you know what, we'll cross that bridge when we come. To it, right? Unfortunately, I haven't been able to go there since, right? But it's a fear to stop people from going. Then when you attack or you kill somebody like Shireen, who's very clearly in a helmet and, and so forth, and you target her in the one place she's not physically protected, the message to journalists now is, okay, I'm going to think twice. If I've got this deployment, I'm married, I've got kids, uh, I don't know, I'm studying for something, I've got parents I'm taking care of, I've got a dog, whatever it is, you have you are human at the end of the day and you have something else to live for aside from your job. You, you will think twice about it. That's not going to make you a coward, by the way, by no means. It just makes you human. And they play on this. So they play on this to ensure that no, journalists won't go. And the less journalists go, the less spotlight is shed on the crimes committed, the more likely those crimes are to continue. Thankfully, obviously, we live in an age where everyone's, everyone's a journalist with their mobile phone. We live in an age where, thankfully, people like Shireen, whose commitment and bravery, without exaggeration, is was unparalleled with all the journalists I worked with and so on. I wasn't even that close. I only worked with her on a couple of assignments. But what I saw from her and then what I saw through other people and going back through her reports, genuinely, it's not just the way she was killed that you know, deserves respect genuinely, and I wish she had, Yani, if she was to, 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 if she was still here, she deserved that uh, acclaim even more so because of what she did. And the existence of people like that, many more that are unsung heroes that we don't know about, that we, Hufran, for example, who isn't giving the same, that, that spotlight will continue. So it's irrelevant how many crimes they continue to commit, but that is their thinking behind it. Israel benefits from striking fear into people and whether that be journalists or ordinary Palestinians that uh, like myself in exile who go to Palestine to try to visit, to try to recreate connections to the land, to the people, we are treated with so much suspicion, interrogation, rough handling, whatever it may be, strip searches, so that we know that if we try to go back, we're going to be subject to the same treatment, mistreatment, and that we will think, you know, maybe I shouldn't go back. I don't want to deal with what I dealt with last time. So part of that is definitely this deterrence of trying to get as many people as possible, whether you're a journalist or any sort of an international, you know, somebody with an outsider away from Palestine, but also to keep Palestinians in exile who are in the millions from developing those connections and, and going back there. They do this all the time. It's, it's their modus operandi. They, you know, and, 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 and the truth is there's always going to be people that are going to go even, you know, what you say is like, is, is relevant in that, yes, on an individual level, there are going to be people that are going to turn down assignments, but there's always going to be someone to take their spot. And so I think that in the end, it's a losing strategy. Yeah. They're not yeah. going to win by doing this. Um, and, you know, we've seen like our previous guest on the Palestine pod, who was on here last week, Adnan Bark. He's a Palestinian mm -hmm. journalist from occupied East Jerusalem. And he makes little move like short films. On That's his, his running, uh, his running video. Yeah, he went viral. He got a hundred thousand yeah. followers in like a week, you know. And now he's at almost two hundred thousand. And there's, you know, Palestinians are making their stories known, whether it be through the mainstream media or not. People that are on the ground, or people who are not on the ground, but who are amplifying the voices of those who are on the ground. So I think, you know. If, if I'm trying to do Israeli PR, honestly, that's not the strategy that I'm going to go for, which is to kill a bunch of journalists and have it make, you know, international news because it's a losing battle there. You know, it's like uphill and very steep. So, uh, I, yeah, those are my thoughts on that. I had a question originally for this, but Michael, if you had a, if you have some thoughts on this. Yeah, it just it goes to show how fully disconnected the people who are making decisions for the occupation are from like public opinion or like the wave of the future, right? They are operating on old talking points, old strategies, and they're just like hitting the same playbook over and over again. 
And I think that it's going to have like kind of a similar outcome to the way that like U.S. drone policy has where it's like, it, you know, the U.S. drone policy is like, oh, we're going to bomb people and that's going to help things. But actually what happens is you radicalize people because you've murdered their family. Right. So it's like, I think in this same instance, you're going to have a ton of people coming out, becoming journalists. Right. And then also you're going to have people who are like, why would I pick up a camera when a camera is viewed as a gun? Why wouldn't I just pick up a gun? You know, so I I think you'll have both. I think, see, the, the parallel you drew there is very important because it all comes down to militarized psyche, right? Uh, Israel being probably the most militarized society in the world and the U.S. obviously in terms of its foreign policy uh, building a big part of that on military expansion and, the, and, and so forth. And I think that's where the issue is when, you know, Lara also saying that, you know, if I was doing the PR, I wouldn't be doing that. <laughs> the, the reality is, honestly, it doesn't matter who does the PR. Genuinely, the, it's a losing game. It's a losing game because, or not, it's unfortunately I say game, I don't mean, I mean in the sense that a year has gone by since the, the events in Jerusalem last year, right? Uh, and what happened and obviously a lot of uh, the uh, ethnic cleansing attempts of Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood and so forth. One of the interesting things I remember, and people were talking at the time of different things, they were talking about, you know, uh, Sheikh Jarrah, they were talking about Al-Aqsa Mosque, they were talking about like uh, Palestinian fighters, the, the connect between Gaza, the West Bank and stuff. One thing that I think wasn't focused on enough, is that within the uh, cities like Lod uh, or Lid and others that have been occupied since 1948, that they are uh, cities uh, that are, are the people living there, the young Arabs living there. They are fourth, fifth generation living under occupation, right? Uh, where it is against the law to teach about the Nakba where there have been every attempt, whether it's through economic co-option or uh, cultural uh, appropriation or whatever you want to call it, every single attempt to try and detach them from the concept of right of return, from the concept of Palestinian identity. In spite of this, right, in spite of this, these aren't people who were kicked out of their homes, their great grandfathers were. The, the young people who took, they came out to the streets and protested and rioted and demanded for their rights and so forth. And this is, this for me personifies something very significant. What this demonstrates is this, firstly, the whole, obviously, without going into the whole lie and the stupidity of, and for people, for people without a land, right? And, and so forth, or, or land without a people for people without a land. Yeah, our, our listeners uh, are already past that point. Yeah, so, you know, where we are here now is that this idea that you can just, the problem of occupation is uh, economic disadvantage. It's not that they're, you're under occupation. The problem of occupation is that there are those who are radicalizing them through other things, through religion, through... No, dude, the problem of occupation is, guess what? This home belonged to me, you've come and taken it, and now not only do I not have a home, uh, I can get shot any time, my younger brother can get detained, uh, my mother when she's pregnant gives birth at a checkpoint, uh, my father to go to work has to go around an hour and a half to get somewhere that he should get to in 15 minutes and, and goes through all the monstrosity checkpoints. That is the problem of the occupation, right? I would say um, the problem of the occupation is Zionism and all of those things are sort of like a result of Zionism. The manifestation right? of it, that's, that's, that's the manifestation of it ultimately, that is what it is, right? You could dismantle a checkpoint, right? But you'd still have illegal settlers who are burning olive trees, right? You could, you could focus on the, the radical marching like fascists inside the Damascus gate, but then you've still got a military that's declaring Masafariyata a firing zone, right? You're never going to fully, like you're playing whack-a-mole unless you fully address Zionism, which is the beginning and end of all of the problems. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think, I think this is where, again, you know, this, the discourse is so important and the language is so important, right? Um, people think it's just terminologies, but, Five years ago, five years ago, just and you guys think back about this, was the use of apartheid with the, 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 the term apartheid within the framework of Israeli occupation and Israel's systematic subjugation of Palestinians. That was never used in the mainstream. It wasn't right. It is now it's accepted when you have Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, world leaders, 
journalists it's a, an accepted fact because only those who want to genuinely literally close their eyes will uh, say otherwise when we're talking now about the idea even of a one-state solution where everybody living in it has equal rights right that I remember my days at university where this was spoken you know I went to a kind of radical left-wing university uh, so as School of Orient and African Studies, uh, ironically, uh, by the name, but at uh, uh, University of London. But we are known for being kind of, you know, like the student body was 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 that kind, and you know, Venezuela solidarity campaigns and palace and all of this uh, this stuff. But it was also, you know, the bastion of the uh, anti-apartheid movement back uh, back in the day, right? So it has a history. And I remember speaking at an event where there was some key Palestinian figures there, without naming them but they were like you know and we spoke and i said you know my personal view is somebody again and i'm talking here from a somebody who believes that all men and women are born equal and all men and women have the right to be free that the only solution to because you know the argument was always oh does that mean uh, israelis should be kicked into the sea blah 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 i said no i believe that the solution quite simply is that you have one state where everybody is equal Right? Those who have taken land of others must give it back. Those who have been expelled must return. And then, uh, you know, this. And I said this, and the two Palestinians who, like I say, you know, have, have dedicated their life to, you know, one was an academic and the other was an activist to, to things, said, Oh, you can't say that. I said, Why can't I say that? I said, You can't talk about one state. You always have to bring it back to two states, and that's what's acceptable, whatever. Now, okay, the, the concept of. A one state that's, that gives equality for all is not, I wouldn't say it's as mainstreamly accepted as the, the fact that apartheid exists. However, when I speak about it, or when others speak about it, they're not looked at in the same, oh, dude, that guy's crazy, as they were 10 years ago. And this comes back to the point we were talking about earlier, was, was it's, like a, it's, a, it's the beginning of the end. It's the beginning of the end and the, and the beginning of a new beginning. It's a process. It will take time. But I think all of these things as, as where I, where, and I, and I think it's important to say this because I, at times like this, because whilst we're hurt by events like the killing of Shari and by, like what with the killing of Ghufran and, and so forth, one should at least take hope from the fact that we're seeing a change. We're seeing a specific trajectory that is pointing towards a better future, one that has, if not total kind of equality, but at least more equality and more freedom. Yeah, and it's always the uh, Israelis who are firing on Gaza fishermen who are like, they're going to kick us into the sea. Mm -hmm. Always. <laughs> Can you just speak briefly about what's happened since the May 20th session when you were questioning the Pentagon spokesperson? It, it, whether in terms of the U.S. response or in terms of what the network has been able to push for or do in, in terms of trying to get justice for Shireen? So on the U.S. level, there's been this initiative from Congress or members of Congress that was uh, or has been led by Congressman Andrew Carson and one of his colleagues. It has over 60 signatures of members of Congress who are uh, sent this letter to the Secretary of State asking for the FBI to lead an independent investigation into the killing because Shireen obviously uh, was an American citizen and they have no belief that the Israelis will be able to. In fact, the Israeli, the, you know, the irony is, the irony of it is the Israelis themselves have said, we will not conduct a yes. criminal investigation, yeah. right? Yet the U.S. administration, through the Pentagon spokesperson and through the same kind of establishment personalities and, and so forth, are essentially trying to bullshit the world into like hoping that this is going to die away and they're going to believe. That's not going to happen. That I can tell you both from somebody who works within the network and the commitment that the network has to seeking justice and as a journalist from a personal capacity and from the people who, who've worked with Shin or who want to continue that the story will not go away one way or the other there's going to be a continuation and a reminder of this at least on a bare minimum there will constantly be people reminding the world about who she was what happened who killed her now whether we have the ability, whether the international community has the appetite and the bravery or the courage, and to be honest, it really isn't that much that's required to carry out an independent investigation and hold people to account, that's a different story. 
There are other dynamics to it that are unfortunately greater than me, greater than Al Jazeera Network, greater than journalist syndicates around the world. Yeah, saying you're going to have the FBI investigate doesn't inspire much hope, right? They're not, that's not great hands to be in. They've got a, they got a history of murdering some of our best and brightest. So I wouldn't, they'd be like, yeah, they did it. We know because we've done similar stuff. So in that clip, the Pentagon spokesperson was trying to, make a distinction between the military and the state and say, oh yeah, yeah, well, it's the military that that isn't going to investigate the Israeli military, but the state should, the Ministry of Interior should. Whereas mm. that distinction does not exist because factually speaking, Israel did not say our Ministry of Interior is going to investigate, whereas our army is not. There was never even, a question by the way, about even, this. even if they did, even if they even did, if they they did even if they did, even if they did. Because the, the, Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Interior does not have any ju jurisdiction over the military anyway. So it was, a, again, sorry, excuse my French, it was a bullshit response anyway, and there was not much I could do about it, right? Unfortunately, he moved yeah. on to the next yeah. question, right? You did the best you could. Yeah, you know, we saw that. And he said, we want a transparent investigation. They never said independent, right? The Americans right. have never said independent, and very few governments, let's say, uh, uh, and politicians have said the word independent, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, an independent one will mean that we need to bring in actually somebody who isn't under either bias towards something or under looking for certain elections that they want to win and therefore making other considerations or whatever. Yeah, transparent is a good distinction because they want everybody to see the cover up. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, yeah. You know, I think it doesn't need an invest. I mean, of course, it needs an investigation legally, so you can get that the 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 justice, right? But we've seen it. You've got a, half a dozen witnesses who are there. You see the f video footage. You've seen the report on CNN. You've seen everything that corroborates with the fact that she was shot. We ha they have the bullet where it was fired from, what type of ammunition it was used. All of that exists. In fact, the Israelis themselves have said yes. yes one of us shot but there was no order to kill all right that just means that they're out here just firing rogue on journalists right it's even worse right that's really nearly, so. like, hey, hey, hey no 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 it wasn't a planned thing we just our guy you know how our guys are sometimes they get an appetite to murder a journalist like and we satiate those desires here at the idf they Wild. came out in the hot ritz and it's worth repeating we've said it on last week's episode but it's worth repeating the israeli army said that the soldiers fired in her direction. Yeah, but in her direction, so randomly that it was one bullet that hit her between her body armor and her helmet. And it so happened to be that the soldier who fired in her direction unintentionally to kill her was also a sniper, trained that precision to killing, right? It so happened to be that she was also trying to seek cover from a tree. It so happened to be that the footage before showed her walking with her colleagues casually, showed that there was zero fire coming from anywhere else. I mean, come on. Like I say, I mean, sometimes, and I remember when I had this interview with the BBC last year after, the, um, after they bombed our offices, and they said, oh, well, you know, Israel claims that there was... Uh, Hamas it, I, at some point it genuinely genuinely is tiring when, when you're hearing it's almost nauseating excuses from the Israelis and their attempts to justify and cover up it it genuinely is tiring it's physically tiring and it's offensive to even give any sort of time or credence or consideration to those arguments yeah when I saw you push back against him and say that's a tired argument I was just like let's go that's all that needs to be said Anytime, and he said, but he says, Bahamas. It's literally a meme at this point. 100% genuinely feel sorry for people who then repeat it because I'm like, do you not have any self respect? Like, let, and this was this was one of the things that kind of I was upset at myself that I should have tried to push further with, with in the last press conference with the Pentagon spokesperson was three weeks ago, there was the American journalist who was killed by the Russians in Ukraine. Tell me, tell me, you would give me the same answer, just change the word Israel with Russia. That's all I'm asking you to do and give me the answer now that you look forward to Russia carrying out a transparent investigation into it and you have full faith. Tell me you do that. You wouldn't. So why? 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 Like, and this is what I, I thankfully I, I feel in one of the greatest things of globalization 
and of free access to information to a certain extent is that people are so much more aware of this. You know, 20, 30 years ago, people were waiting for, and as journalists, they would go and, you know, you'd film something and by the time you get the tape out and then send it and whatever, it's like a week until the world actually hears what's happened and there's so much time to cover up and to do. Now, it doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist. Everything's there. Anyone who's going to commit something is going to. And whilst, yes, there is still, unfortunately, a lack of justice in the world, ultimately, that's only going to last for so long because people will demand justice. People, once they know, you know, the whole idea of empowering through knowledge and information and education, that empowerment is a process. That knowledge and information and education is happening and it's increasing day by day. And when it gets to a critical point, there's no stopping it. Sheesh, my man is cutting promos like the WWE. <laughs> <laughs> Can you speak just a little I mean, bit about I mean, the network? Because I'm, I'm curious and I know, I mean, I, I know that there's obviously the network is at least in part held by the state of Qatar. Is there something happening on the state level? Is there, what's the network doing? Can you speak a little bit about that? Really quickly, can I just interject? I remember I joked on the last episode, I was like, hey, maybe the occupation bombed the AP back into the passive tense, right? Like just, they started, yeah. they started reporting differently after their whole offices got targeted by rockets. You know, that is Israeli diplomacy. This is, this is the point, unfortunately. This is where, where we get a bit infuriated is that, especially like when you say people like who, who, whoever wrote the stuff of the AP, right? Like your colleagues, do you not have any respect for them? Those who lived in Gaza, who worked, who sacrificed their lives, who saw their livelihood just crumble, right? And then you come and write something that so evidently is inaccurate, is cowardly, spineless. Come on, man. Like, at least just if it's not for the respect of the truth, for the respect of your colleagues and, and so forth, you know? What the hell's wrong with the people who are writing these headlines do and because they there was somebody who asked uh you know uh blinken whether or not they got any follow-up from the bombing of the ap or al jazeera building and he was basically like those concerns still exist which means no nothing no. they just bombed the the fucking press and people were like sounds good keep it moving i got a job to do that's the truth there is another whole new level of struggle which is in the bureaucracy and in the political establishments and and, and so forth you know and, and you know i met with uh, some some uh, lawmakers and some staffers on the hill when i was in dc and stuff and you know to be honest even those who were the most sympathetic with what's happening also were not as screwed up as they should be quite frankly with what was happening you know and you would speak to some of them and they just weren't aware so there is like i say there is a process of education and, and information and it is has it has been you know the interesting thing is and, and you guys and, and the viewers and, and go and do this you'll find it on youtube you can go and look at the bbc archives from back in the uh 40s right yeah i don't recommend it on palestine right but this one no no i'll give you this one i wrote for one thing for one reason but generally, I'll tell you why. Because in it, for example, the way they reported the bombing of the King David Hotel um, and others, the language used was uh, uh, terror groups or Jewish terror groups or Jewish militia were doing this and so forth, right? That's because the things that they were bombing were British outposts, right? So the British were now reporting on their own victim. Awesome. Like, they were like, hey, these guys, are, these guys are wild. <laughs> I know yeah. we promised them some land, but we fucked up, I think. I don't know. Right. And, and that was the language, right? And even those who then were even reporting on the Nakba at the time and what was happening, right? The language that was used was used in a specific way that at least had some sort of a reflection of the truth. There then became a very clear departure from that truth through many different things, through misinformation, through lobbying, through just ignorance in terms of some of these media outlets just don't have the resources to send people. The Arab world also did not have bilingual journalists who were able to go or, you know, a plethora, to be honest, you know, until now, my, my mother looks at me like, you know, I'm not a doctor, like, I'm a, you know, <laughs> so it wasn't like journalism wasn't the most, you know, sought after career in the Arab world, right? So it's only been recently that you've had all of these things. But why I say this is because, so that trajectory went and it departed from the truth until you got to the point where the Israeli occupation was defending itself 
against the uh, uh, you know notoriously evil devilish uh, Palestinian terrorists who wanted to kick them in the sea into the sea right what we're now witnessing over the past 10 years and I, and I do believe 2008 was a hugely significant watershed moment and the war in Gaza and the use of white phosphorus and the the bombs that were happening and the images that came out from Shifa hospital and that's why I generally the journalists who were there covering on the ground deserve a lot of respect for it right we are seeing a re return to so it's not a it, it's a correction of the narrative right mm. so it's not it, we're not uh, and it's a reclaiming of the narrative from a truthful perspective right what we saw before was a re-narration of things in a in a in an inaccurate way um and i think that's something that's that's hugely significant and and and, and something that i think is at the core of why people like Shireen, unfortunately, uh, was killed, and why, unfortunately, more journalists will be targeted. This episode is called Reclaiming the Narrative. <laughs> I'm a trademark that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. But getting back, sorry, Lara, because you asked the question about uh, what Al Jazeera is doing, just, just to, to correct, and I know it's a, it's a, it's a fine point, but I, I, I would, uh, I should uh, uh, mention here, obviously. So Al Jazeera is funded, it's partly, it's a public-private entity. So it's partly funded by the state. It's not owned by the state. It is, and I know funding. It's almost, okay. It, yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, yeah. why that's important just to to note is because, uh, whilst for example, uh, you know, uh, let's say, Russia t Today or uh, Abu Dhabi News or whatever or some of these, they're owned and therefore they get a very clear directive, which is fine. Everyone's entitled to to their thing, but they get a very sure. clear directive. Our editorial direction has nothing to do with. When I say nothing to do, as in, we do not get any edicts, any directives, or anything from any state entity, right? And not, again, I know Michael's not a big fan of the BBC and, and so forth, but it's closer to the BBC model in that the BBC is funded by UK taxpayers' money, but it's not owned by the by the government, right? So it's state-funded. So it's close, it. close to that model, but just to, to clarify. Now, obviously, that... What that means is, yes, obviously we're hosted here in Qatar, and uh, and I'm actually I'm in Doha now. I just got back, like I said, from 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 the US, and there is Qatar element to things. In the end of the day, that's that's right. So looking at what's being done, thankfully from a leadership perspective, and I say this because I believe when we're in a region where uh, the vast majority of the leaders are either military dictators or despots or absolute monarchies, yes, Qatar is not a democracy, but uh, its leadership. Um, is one that has pursued for many years a very key policy of pluralism uh, and uh, open discourse, which I think is, is something that has manifested itself both in terms of uh, Al Jazeera, but also in terms of conflict resolution and so forth. And when it's come to Palestine, when we saw the Amir of Qatar speaking at the World Economic Forum about Shalina Abu Akli, and you know, the, one of the most crazy things was when he came to speak about her, one of the Israeli delegates decided to get out uh, and walk out, stormed off, like, how dare you call us out on killing a journalist? I'm out of here, you know? So so from our leadership, we have the assistant foreign minister, Lulwa al Khatr, who, for the audience, they should check her out on Twitter, I think, generally is one of the most inspiring political figures that I've seen as a female senior diplomat who has always spoken out in terms of that. But that's, that's by the by, that's just me living here and telling you. In terms of the network, what's more significant, the network will be pursuing this case we've announced already legally. We've joined an international coalition of uh, press freedom advocates and organizations and uh, journalist unions who will be seeking this out. We're going to be looking at this from uh, different perspectives and in different countries. Uh, the justice that we're going to be seeking will not just be in one place, it will be wherever and whenever we can. And I say whenever because there is a commitment that we will see this through. Shireen, again, Shireen joined months after we launched in 1996. She joined in 1997. So just months, we, we launched in uh, uh, November of, uh, of 96. She joined a few months after. She was an icon. She was an inspiration. She was somebody who never said no to anybody who's, who, who genuinely committed her life. I remember I was speaking to one of uh, our colleagues in the Al Arabic newsroom about it, and he was showing me a WhatsApp message of the Sunday before she was killed that they needed a report out. She was on, uh, on her day off and she had guests at home uh, so he said to her listen can you just find somebody whatever so she responded saying in a voice note saying uh you know what i'm gonna do it myself I'll, i can you know feed the guests i'll leave them do their thing i'm gonna go and come back 
her commitment, like I was saying before earlier, was unparalleled, genuinely un un unparalleled. I mean, and you hear these stories constantly, and I'm telling you, somebody that I have worked in the same network for the past 16 years with her, and I, like I said, I've been on assignment with her before, there are many that I don't know about, and you hear them and you're like, Phew. like, you, th you thought you were good at your job, and then you hear what she did, and, and, and that's why, you know, it, it was at least somewhat, um, somewhat reassuring to see the outpouring of love that she got, and, and, and despite the disgusting uh, uh, action that was taken by the occupation soldiers in Jerusalem, but to see Jerusalem essentially uh, anoint her their kind of queen that day, that was that was something that that gave us. So we will be pursuing it, both in terms of a legal perspective as well as uh, wherever and whenever we can shed a light on it and the need for action to be taken, not just for to to seek justice, but part of seeking justice for Shireen is ensuring that we find a way to stop impunity when it comes to governments, regimes around the world attacking journalists, wherever they may be. Yeah, that's got to be the most Palestinian story I ever heard. You feed your guests and then go do your job. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, it was a, it's a commitment that's, you know, it, like I say, I can't, I can't, you know, I don't know anyone who was at that level. Yeah, I mean, I join millions of people who are just praying for justice for Shreen, justice for all the journalists that... The apartheid state has targeted, including Hofran, justice for the medics that they've targeted, justice for anybody that they've targeted that's a civilian, that's a person who is fighting for freedom and the right to live on their land with equal rights and some dignity. I maybe just if you have like two more minutes. Oh, yeah. Let me just ask you about Gaddafi real quick. Why? Yeah. Michael's been dying to ask you about Gaddafi. <laughs> 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 we we thought we were gonna go more with that like we thought it was gonna be like half half but we ended yeah up no it's the whole time. it's been eighty twenty it feels <laughs> if you just have two minutes so that Michael go for it go for it like, awesome okay so you have obviously done some fantastic groundbreaking reporting what is the craziest thing that you found in Gaddafi's intelligence headquarters I'm gonna say it you're not gonna believe it I'm gonna take a picture of it and send it to you. Put it up I, on the pod. <laughs> I, I will. Unfortunately, it's not with me here. It, it is at home. When I get home, I will. If I if I have your consent, obviously, I don't want to yeah, <laughs> leak, yeah, no, no, leak no, anything classified. Fine. I uh, obviously I was I was covering the Arab Spring, right? So I covered from Egypt and and, and the rest. And, and Libya obviously started uh, February of 2011, and then by August the rebels entered uh, Tripoli, and. I was actually meant to go on a deployment that it was it was Ramadan it was 20th I believe 19th 20th of August and I was meant to be going to Somalia for another deployment this happened the rebels they surprised a lot of people they entered and so forth got, went into the newsroom I was called into the newsroom in the evening so they told me forget about Somalia you're going to Tripoli because we only had one team at the time another amazing reporter by the way I want to shout out because I think there's so many female journalists that we have that Really, if they were working at other networks, they would get so much more uh, exposure. We have uh, Zaina Khudr, she is um, currently now our reporter in Beirut, uh, international award winning journalist, phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal person. So she was there on the ground uh, with the rebels. She entered, but there was only one team, obviously. It's a massive story. You've got to cover your rolling news and so forth. Anyway, I get there. Get to Tripoli. Uh, we, what I did was I flew to Tunisia and then we crossed the border from Jirba through the Western mountains into it. And I'm crossing, it's me and one cameraman, a uh, colleague of mine. All I have with me is a satellite phone that has 50% battery, right? And, you know, we get there to Tripoli. By the time we get there, it's the morning. Um, and, you know, there was other teams coming from across the network. We converge, we find out where our satellite truck is. We meet there. Everyone's going through their own story. We talk, whatever, and stuff. As I was driving, as we were going into uh, to it, I noticed, and here I think is one of the important things of having journalists and where I think Al Jazeera is good, that speak the language of where they're reporting from, right? So they know. So I see, and this is where I had a bit of an advantage on some of the more senior colleagues that were uh, that only spoke English. I see the headquarters of the intelligence. It literally got a huge sign, right? Uh, or whatever was written on the, on the top. 
So, you know, everyone wants to do, I'm going to go with the rebels, I'm going to go and find, because Qaddafi's son was, uh, was still loose. Uh, there were some journalists who were stuck in a hotel, a uh, mix of things. So, you know, I was young at the time. I was, I was the junior reporter at the time. I said, all right, if you don't mind, I'm going to go somewhere else. And the, 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 the producer uh, who was running the coverage was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, go play. So, all right, cool. So, you know, I find this young Libyan guy who is speaking English, just meet him. He's got a car. I'm like, dude, take me to this place, right? He's like, yeah, but I need a vest, right? Because like, I've got my, my, my vest. I'm like, I don't have a vest, whatever. We start talking. We have also like these stab vests that we, we have in case you go into protests, right? Like big protests that you wear just in case. So I said, this is all I've got. He's like, all right, whatever. Anyway, as we start driving, we, we're getting close to the place and then uh i can sense he's like very nervous like you know he was he was like 20 or something at the time i was I, you know, so uh i was 26 27 at the time and uh or 20. he so I, I tell him listen dude you know what you're scared evidently it's cool uh just drop me off here so he drops me off here i start walking in the streets of tripoli and i'm not even sure where the hell i'm heading and whatever and there's like a few gunfire here and there get to the headquarters in the end right <laughs> get to the headquarters, these like rough up rebels, each one with like, you know, AK-47s or whatever they were firing or, or the weapons, I'm not a weapons expert, but they've all got their like, you know, I think they had like M6, I can't even remember what they were called, but they had all these, their weapons with them. And obviously in like slippers, right? Or like Reebok trainers or like just random, like they just looked funny, like the, the whole kind of thing, but you know, misfits, like genuine misfits, right? Yeah, the fit is immaculate, I'm, I'm imagining. <laughs> Yeah, it's meant, there was one, and you'll see him in my report, he's got like a fisherman's hat, right? He's got a fisherman's hat. He hasn't shaved for like God knows how long, you know, and obviously hasn't showered for ages, whatever. I mean, these guys were fighting for their freedom and whatever. So, I, you know, not to kind of belittle that, but I'm just telling you from how I'm looking at it. Like, it's just... Anyway, I go in. This building has been bombed at least once, right? Half of it. I'm like, I need to go on. So I end up going into uh, the office of Abdullah Sunusi. Abdullah Sunusi was the head of... Gaddafi's intelligence, one of the most feared humans, not just like in Libya, but uh, uh, around the, the region, right? And Gaddafi was was next level crazy. I mean, everyone knows that, but I, like I'll tell you, again, growing up in London, we had, uh, I remember one guy at school with me whose father was assassinated in London outside a grocery store, and you can check this up in Queensway uh, by, by Libyan special agents who were sent uh, to kill him so like you he was mental like the, this guy was merciless so i go in obviously and we're, we're filming different things now you're asking me the funny story this very long story but the funny thing was i literally find a file in arabic it's written uh, right which translates to the file of hijacking planes and explosives right so, and I, I take it with me. I've taken the, the file. That's crazy. George Bush got a similar file. He just ignored it. I did. <laughs> so I open it. Unfortunately, like half this shit's gone, right, from it. But that's, the, and then there was other files. There was files of like their, their negotiations with the Houthis. There was files. They, he was negotiating with everyone. He was like funding like people left, right, and center, right? There was files that had, and this one I put out in my report and we showed the documents of how he was in discussions with certain members of Congress and Senate up until two months before, whilst the US was bombing or part of NATO to try and like spin and how he had sent his son and other people to Cairo and so forth, or his cousin rather, uh, 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 to Cairo to, to do. But just seeing that file for a split second, like I'm, you know, I'm a 26 year old uh, <laughs> reporter, like I've done one, you know, I've done one or two big stories, but like, you know, and I see it and I'm like, shit, I've got Lockerbie right there, right? That's what, what you think, you know? So, like, for a second, I'm genuinely shaking. I'm looking at it. Obviously, I opened it. Unfortunately, like, I'm pretty sure people went through a lot of these files, and that's why it was just thrown on his desk. Like, there was stuff that was taken before they left and so forth. But, um, but yeah, it was just, you know, if anything, it was, like, the most ironic thing to find lying there, you know? That is wild. Okay, one more follow-up. I'm sorry. That was so juicy. <laughs> that was... You can't, tell, oh, you can't tell stories like that and try to get yeah. off the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. We're, We're not going to let you leave. We're holding We're you doing captive We're doing forever. Yeah. Doing. Hey, welcome to Gaddafi's military intelligence headquarters. Okay. Um, 
So you were talking about like there are people fighting for their freedom. And I don't discount that there were Libyans who obviously rose up against Gaddafi. But we also now know that U.S. intelligence and eventually then President Barack Obama intervened in Libya to topple Gaddafi. From your reporting, you had like pretty close relations with the operatives who toppled Gaddafi. Were there any indications at the time that rebel forces were communicating or working with CIA or other foreign intelligence? There's a, they were definitely operating with foreign powers. There was no doubt about that because they wouldn't have got what they got without, I mean, that's, again, unless someone's blind, and I, I try to be as objective as possible, regardless of what I believe, of course, they were they were operating with, and, you know, we touched down, uh, like I say, in in, uh, in Jirba Airport in uh, on the border of Tunisia, and you saw C-30 uh, military planes that didn't have flags on them. Right, purposefully. So, of course, there's no doubt that there was, right? I mean, this, I, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, and here's the question, you know, how much of the Arab Spring protests was genuine, right? Uh, and how much was uh, orchestrated? That's a very good question. My my view, obviously, from a, I can only talk about what I saw, and I can also talk about what I experienced as um, an Arab in diaspora, right, who a lot of my friends, uh, and my own, you know, my own family history of uh, people who either fled their own home countries because of the oppressive nature of those regimes, or because of the economic disaster that the, that existed in those regimes because of the oppressive and corrupt nature. Right? No one can deny that Gaddafi, Mubarak, all of these people were corrupt as hell, were oppressive as hell. Uh, there was no freedom, and so forth. Yeah. For the record, I don't dispute that. By the way. Yeah. Yeah. But so so but but what I would say is this for sure. Again, also there's we you know no one can dispute that those opposed to them weren't either willingly or unwillingly infiltrated and or used by regional or international powers. That's the that's another fact of the matter, right? Herein then lies my personal frustration, right? Which is that the vast majority of people, whether not just in the Arab world, anywhere else in the world, would like to live in a society whereby they have self-determination, where they have freedom, where they have the right to choose what they want to be, what how they, they want their life to, to look like, right? Unfortunately, particularly in colonized countries, and I say colonized because I, I, I do not believe we live in an age of post-colonialism. I, I believe we just live in a reinvented colonization that takes different forms and, and, and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, our societies are always given this choice between shit and shitter. We're not good enough to be given the choice of freedom of, of that democracy, right? And we saw it, we saw it, for example, again, in Egypt, as I covered Egypt extensively uh, up until the coup in 2013. And this is not by, it has nothing to do with who won or didn't win the elections or uh, uh, ideological issues. This is very, comes down to a very simple belief that you either believe that people have the right to choose or you don't and when they chose because that choice threatened the specific status quo including the existence of the occupation you suddenly had all of these resources directed towards toppling it and so forth and as a journalist i'll tell you we were also one of the first targeted al jazeera in egypt we had dozens literally dozens of our journalists arrested uh, beaten. I was uh, beaten and detained on more than one occasion in Egypt. I can't go back to Egypt now. I haven't gone since 2013. Um, we just had uh, one of our colleagues, a presenter uh, on Al Jazeera Mubasha channel, two days ago, uh, sentenced to 15 years in absentia because, believe it or not, he conducted an interview, literally, because he interviewed a political figure who has been in jail now for the past three years, but he interviewed him three years ago in London. He interviewed him in London as well. And then that political figure was also interviewed by the BBC. Well, the BBC journalist hasn't been tried in absentia or sentence, right? Uh, has been given 15 years uh, in jail. So again, I think this is where uh, I do like to uh, commend Al Jazeera as a network and my colleagues is that, yes, nobody's perfect and we do have our own faults and shortcomings for sure. But thankfully, uh, by and large, the fact that we constantly find ourselves being attacked by the most autocratic and despotic regimes, I think is a vindication of at least a large part of our work being on the right track. Exactly. Judge me by my enemies. Yeah.
I got too many though, I'll tell you that. So you're gonna be taking a long time to judge me. Honestly, the I the list I, the list is adding up for me too. Yeah. Um, yeah. This episode was so good. You're in, you're amazing. Insane, you're an insane you, person. No, no, that's, <laughs> that's not very nice. That's not no, how I would describe him. <laughs> no, I think I, she means that in like a good way. I do. <laughs> it's like the biggest compliment ever. Oh, okay, because for me that would be like sad, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, you, I know you probably got stories for days, but so thank you for taking some time to just share some of them with us. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Appreciate well, your time. It was mine. It was amazing. Thank you. Bye bye. Nice to meet you, bud. <laughs> Take care. See you. Awesome. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Palestine Pod. Check out our full episodes and updated sources at www.palestinepod.com. You can send us an email at palestinepod at gmail.com. You can follow us on Instagram at the Palestine Pod. And you should check out our Patreon because we've got some interesting things cooking over there. www.patreon.com slash Palestine Pod. That's been another episode of the Palestine Pod. Thank you all so much for listening. Have a great day. 